And my welcome uh, to Wills. Um, be good to have John 30 in front of you. Uh, I'll pray first and then I'll read the bit that I forgot to ask Karen to read. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this chance to learn together from your words. And we pray that we would do that this morning. Teach us, we pray, uh, by your spirit, that we may understand more of what you've done for us and more what that demands of us. And we ask that for Christ's sake. Amen. I meant to say verse 21 uh, to 30, so let me read the last nine verses, uh, chapter 13. After he had said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, Very truly, I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another, at a loss to know which of them he meant. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and said, Ask him which one he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. So Jesus told him, What you're about to do, do quickly. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought that Jesus uh, was telling him to buy what was needed for the festival or to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out, and it was night. Well, it would be helpful to still have that open in front of you uh, as we look at it this morning. And I have a simple aim, really, this morning. It's a very simple aim. It's to show you as clearly as I can from this passage what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, an authentic believer in him. And that's my aim this morning because I think it's uh, John's aim as he writes and Jesus' aim as he speaks to the disciples. Mark's gospel, uh, you may know, is uh, described by some people, particularly uh, the second half of it, as something of of a discipleship manual. And I think actually John's gospel can be considered in a similar light. From chapter 13 onwards, the second half of the gospel, much of it is devoted to teaching the disciples. Up to this point, it's been his public ministry. But from chapter 13 onwards, he's very much got the disciples in his mind. It's known, what we're looking at in the next few Sundays is known as the upper room discourse. Um, John doesn't actually refer to it as the upper room, the other Gospels do, but it's also called the farewell discourse, and I think that's fairly understandable why. A farewell, it's the last night before he's betrayed, last night with his disciples, his last chance to teach them what it will mean for them once he's gone. And so he starts to teach them. And I hope we'll see that what he has to say is very important You can imagine that, can't you, on the last night? Everything that he says is significant. And we'll see over these chapters that discipleship, how to live as his followers once he's no longer with them, is a key theme for what we'll be looking at. And so that's my aim this morning, to show you the character, the nature, the character of authentic Christian discipleship. And to see alongside that, it's only really possible, only made possible, by Christ's death for us. It's a response to what he's done. It flows from, it can only flow from that and being connected to that, to understanding what Jesus has done and embracing it for ourselves. You see, unless we do that, we can't be a disciple. The cross, that's the starting point. And that's what shapes everything else. And verse 12, uh, if you glance down, shows us that. Immediately after the fush- wa- fo- foot washing uh, that we looked at last week, Jesus asks them if they've understood what he's done. Do you understand what I've done for you, he asked. 
And he asks them that, even though he knows from verse 7 that they haven't. They don't yet realize what he's done and the significance of it. They will come to understand it once everything has played out. As they look back on this event, they will understand after Jesus died and raised and returned to the Father. As they look back on these events, they'll understand well, what he's done for them, what the foot washing meant, how he's cleansed them, how he's been their Passover lamb, how he's rescued them, redeemed them, forgiven them, washed them, cleansed them. We saw last week that this whole foot washing thing is really a, an enacted parable, a, uh, a sort of prophetic action that interprets what he's going to do on the cross for them, that terrible event. And we saw how they'll need to respond to that event. They'll need to submit to it, to embrace it. Verse 8, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. So all that's the necessary background to what we're focusing on this week, verse 12 to 30. Uh, and if you missed last week and want to catch up, as every week it's on the website. Because if you haven't come to Jesus, if he hasn't cleansed you, what he then goes on to say about discipleship will, well, it really won't make any sense, to be honest, as well as being impossible. You can't serve Christ unless he's first served you, unless he's redeemed you, unless, as Paul would say, unless you've been baptized with Christ, unless you can't be raised with him if you haven't been buried with him. You can't be united with Christ in his resurrection if you haven't been united with him in his death. Or, as John's, to use John's language, you must be born again. So that's the first thing, the foundational truth of this chapter. But there's a second one that I want to focus on this morning. And that comes in verse 15. Do you see when Jesus says, after the event of the fush washing, he says, I've set you an example that you should do as I have done. What does he mean? Does he mean that we're all to strip down to our waist, get bowls of water and wash one another's feet? Well, I don't think so because we're not Jesus. We're not commanded to do. We can't do everything he does. But also, but we've, as we saw last week, what he's doing in the foot washing is an enacted parable. He's teaching them about, about his death, yes, but also, verse 15, about how they are to follow him, the character of their discipleship. Because if you remember, if you were here, the washing of the feet wasn't, well, it wasn't normal what Jesus did. It wouldn't be the host's job at a meal to wash his guests' feet. It wouldn't be a job that he would have done. It wouldn't be a job that they would have done to another. It wouldn't have even been a job that the sl a Jewish slave would have done. If it were done, it would have been done by the lowest of the low, the Gentile slave and probably a woman at that. Yet he had done it for them. He had washed their feet in willing self-humiliation. An example to the disciples of how they are to serve, how they are to pick up their cross and follow him. The character, the nature of authentic discipleship is a sacrificial service of God's people. Not standing on rights or statuses, but serving one another. Not standing on the order of your serving, but serving at once. You see a need, you can meet that need, so you do. You don't consider it beneath you, you don't wait for someone else to do it, and you do not do it to be seen to do it. Look at me, I'm such a servant. Now you do it because it needs to be done. The authentic Christian life is one of humble service, costly service, sacrificial service. Jesus gave his life in costly, sacrificial service for his people. That's the example he wants us to follow. That's what his, he's calling his disciples to. And do you know that no, please, this is not just to be a one-off thing, you know, done that, tick. It's not even an occasional thing, tick. And it's certainly not a ritualistic thing. 
He's not telling them here to reenact a ceremony once a year, Maundy Thursday perhaps, to be captured on camera and posted online, tick. Now that's to miss the point completely. One of the reformers, uh, 16th century reformers, who probably speak more robustly than many do today, uh, of people who turned this parable into a ceremony to be enacted, said this. Every year, they have a fashion of washing some people's feet, as if it were a farce which they're playing on a stage. And so when they have performed this idle and unmeaning ceremony, they think they have fully discharged their duty and reckon themselves at liberty to despise their brethren during the rest of the year. This display of buffoonery, great word that, isn't it? Therefore is nothing else than a shameful mockery of Christ. And he concludes, at all events, Christ does not here enjoin an annual ceremony but bids us be ready throughout the whole of life to wash the feet of our brethren and neighbours. Now, I have no particular insight into the motives of people who will, in, over the next week or so, uh, go through and reenact uh, the ceremony in the, in the route to Easter. But surely it's correct to say, isn't it, that Jesus here is not talking about some ceremonial performance. He has in mind a way of life, the whole of life, a daily, moment-by-moment, lifelong thing that both reflects on Christ's death and reflects it in that giving of himself for us. Well, if that's the case, who are the disciples to serve? Well, it seems, verse 14, that he has particularly other disciples in view. You should wash one another's feet. So an example of the one anothering of the New Testament, bear with one another, forgive one another, teach one another, be compassionate to one another, be kind to one another. But note that Judas is still in the room at this point. Judas has just washed his feet the feet of someone who is about to betray him, the feet of his enemy. And note, will you, that this service is not born of a sense of obligation, that it's not born out of a sense of duty. It's not born of guilt or shame, just as it's not being done to win brownie points or gain status. It's not for self-promotion. That would be an anathema, wouldn't it, given what he said already? What's the motivation then? Well, simply this. It's born of an understanding of what Christ has done for you, who he is and what he's done, and a commitment to follow in his footsteps. A number of us, as you know, are working through Mark's Gospel at midweek on Wednesday evening. It's a small group Bible study. It's not a closed group. Anyone can come. Anyone's welcome to come and join us. But last week, we were looking at Mark 10 together. And I just wanted, it struck me as we were looking at it, how these two passages resonated. So if you just want to turn back to page 1015, it's Mark 10. Um, and just look at it very briefly, because I think it's striking how, uh, what it says. So if we pick it up at verse 41, Jesus is teaching them, his disciples, what his death will achieve and what it will mean. And Mark makes the same point. Mark 10, 42, Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Well, what are they to do then? Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. They're to be slaves. Well, that's strong language, isn't it? Sounds even stronger. Why are they to be slaves one of another? Well, verse 45, because that's the path that Jesus has trod, and they're to do likewise. Verse 45, for because even the Son of Man 
even the Lord Jesus, did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. I was at a church some years ago now uh, who had a couple of ministry apprentices. Actually, they weren't called, they weren't called a ministry apprentices. This is, this is so long ago, it's before these things even exist. So they, they weren't called ministry apprentices, they were called slaves. You know, I'm not sure you get away with it today. But even then, and we're talking 30 plus years ago, a long time ago, even then there was some pushback against calling them slaves. The reply to that pushback was, to be a disciple of Christ is to be a slave. A slave in that context is to occupy a position of great honour. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. So back to John 13, will you? What will help the disciples live this radical way? And it is very radical. What things will enable them to persevere in this life of sacrificial service once Christ is no longer with them? Well, I think we get two uh, suggestions in in these verses. and I, I want to look at each of them in turn in our remaining time. One is by reflecting on Jesus' identity and the other on his betrayal. So firstly, his identity. Verse 16 Truly, truly, says Jesus, underlining the importance of it. So, okay, big, bold letters, highlighted, underlined. No servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If after Jesus is gone, they were to follow his example, what would that mean? Rephrase that. If they were to not follow in his example, what would it mean? Well, it would mean that they thought themselves greater than Jesus, wouldn't it? You call me teacher, verse 13, and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. He's their teacher, he's their Lord. But he's more than that, isn't he, verse 18? He quotes Psalm 41, the psalm we looked at a moment ago, a psalm of David that identifies him as David's king, the Messiah. He's their king. But more than that, verse 19, it takes it even further. Knowing what is about to happen, he tells them. Well, the disciples have no idea at this point what's going on, even though they've been told they're at a loss, verse 22. But Jesus isn't. How can he know what's going to pan out? Verse 19, I am who I am. He takes to himself the name of Yahweh, their God. And when things unfold as they will, as he predicted, the disciples will come to see, looking back, reflecting on what he said here, to understand and to believe that, yes, Jesus is, I am who I am. He's their God. So what have we got? Jesus is their Lord, he's their master, he's their Messiah, he's their king, he's their God. That is who is going to the cross for them. For us, he will pour out his life for them, for us. And if they or if we are unwilling to follow in that example, well, it can only mean that we fail to understand who he is, fail to really understand what he's done, fail to understand who we really are. Is one of the reasons that we balk at such sacrificial service of one another that we think ourselves too important? And that walking such a path is beneath us? I'm too important for that. Yeah, okay, I can see it needs doing, and but it's not my job. It's someone else. Hospitals, like most workplaces, are very hierarchical places. Uh, and medicine is, is no exception. Uh, are you an F1? An F2? Oh, you're an ST1, ST2, ST3, SPR? Ooh, consultant. Top dog. Like Arsenal, top of the table. <coughs> hierarchy matters. And where you sit on that hierarchy matters, doesn't it? It makes a big difference to what you do. The whole point about being at the top of the tree is that 
those on the branches below do stuff so you don't have to. Clark the patients, take the bloods, arrange the scans, chase the results, see the extras. And then of course there's the nurses and the others, the people who actually look after the patients, feed them, wash them, wash their feet. See how Jesus transforms that idea of hierarchy? He completely subverts it. Uh, Leslie Newbigin was a missionary and, and a leader of a, a, of a previous century. Says of this foot washing account, he says the foot washing is a sign of the total overthrow of the power of this world in which the majesty of God is manifest in the menial service of a slave. Jesus is at the top of the tree. No one higher, couldn't be any higher than Jesus. Couldn't have sunk any lower, mind. Gave up everything for you, for me. And his disciples are to respond in like measure. Do you see Newbigin again? He says, the debt which we owe to him, to God, is discharged by our subjection to our neighbor in love and service. This cannot be an action of our own moral insight. It can only be the fruit of what Jesus has done. The same point. Do we sometimes think that service in this way or that way must be a job for someone else? Do we perhaps sometimes think that some form of service is beneath us? I suspect we do, to be honest. Because I know my heart. And I know your hearts are no different. But do we really think we're higher than Jesus? I mean, to ask the question is to answer it, isn't it? So the first thing that will help keep us on track is a reflection on Jesus' identity. The second thing I think that will help keep us on track here, again, woven throughout the, the verses of this account, is a reflection on his betrayal. I wonder if you've ever been betrayed. Uh, snitched on at school, stitched up by colleagues at work, let down by family, friends. In some small measure, I expect we all have at some time or other. How did it feel? Jesus is betrayed here and deeply troubled. And that account is woven in these verses. So verse 2, the evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. Verse 18, I'm not referring to you all, I know these, those I have chosen, but this is to fulfill this passage of scripture. He who shared my bread has turned against me. And do you remember Psalm 41? Even my close friend, someone who I trusted, one who shared my bread has turned against me. Ask him which one he means. Lord, who is it? It is the one to whom I give this piece of bread. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, and Judas took it. So alongside this reminder of Jesus' identity, how high and exalted Jesus is, we get the counterpoint, don't we? We have a reminder of how low he was brought and how much it cost him. And it cost him a great deal. You see, Jesus wasn't just arrested by his enemies. He was betrayed into their hands by a friend. And Judas and Jesus, they must have known each other well. They traveled together for years, eaten together, faced the highs and lows of his ministry together, sharing meals and companionship together. He was one of the 12, wasn't he? One of his closest friends. And it, it wasn't obvious that he was the one who was going to betray him, was it? None of the other disciples knew they can't imagine that it's going to be Judas. I mean, even when he leaves, they think he's going to, well, he's left to give, them, you know, give something to the poor or buy some supplies. Not sell Jesus. Yes, Jesus knew the betrayal was coming, but knowing that it was coming didn't make it any easier because Jesus loved him. He loved Jesus. He just washed his feet. 
Fully God, yes, but fully human too, and not unaffected by that betrayal. Verse 21, it hurts. The closer the relationship, the deeper the hurt. That's why unfaithfulness in marriage is so devastating. Why does John tell us all this? Why does he tell us as he does by weaving it in amongst the, the account of the explanation of the cross and the way of the cross? I think it is to encourage us. You see, if you are to follow Jesus in his, his example of a life of self-sacrificial service for God's people, there will be a cost. Investing in people is costly. In all kinds of different ways. It'll cost you time, it'll cost you energy, sometimes it'll cost you money, it's tiring. And there are other things that just seem more preferable, even more interesting, more rewarding, you might think. And the people that you invest in, that you serve, they will let you down. Just like you'll let them down at times. And it will hurt. Sometimes it will hurt a lot when promises are not kept, when commitments are not followed through. Not because they necessarily dislike you or that you have done anything wrong, although you may have done. But because they're people like you. They're just being people. That's what people are like. It will help to have a robust doctrine of sin and the fullness of humankind if we're going to serve as Jesus served. Because following Jesus' example is a recipe for being mistreated. I think we need to be realistic about this. We need to be clear-headed. It's not going to be plain sailing, a walk in the park. Your efforts won't be universally appreciated and there won't be continuous thanks. Living like Jesus commands his disciples to, well, it will be a recipe in some ways for being mistreated. But when we are, it will help us to remember Jesus and his authentic obedience to his Father. It can be tough. That's just the way it is. You don't deserve it, probably not. Neither did Jesus. Now, don't mishear me. This does not make poor behaviour unacceptable. Unaccept- Nor that there, will, there may come a time when you decide, no, enough is enough. It's, not, it's important to flee abusive relationships. But it does mean, doesn't it, that following Jesus in a life of self-sacrifice at times will be hard. But he's gone that way for us. And in case you think, well, that just sounds a bit too negative and stoical, will you note verse 17 as we close? You see, even in this life, we can be confident that serving Jesus in this way is worth it. It is not all pain and no gain, even in this life. Yes, it will involve some discomfort, but verse 17, do you note? Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Living like this, a life of sacrificial service of others, is actually how to be blessed. There is reward and joy and blessing in walking this path. Blessed is the man or woman who follows Jesus in this way. And I know that there are many here this morning who can testify to that. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for Jesus' example of sacrificial service. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that that might be a model for all of us here as we serve one another, as we serve others. And we ask that for Christ's sake. Amen.